Well, I think it would benefit our, our viewers to, to, to hear from Father John. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, he's not from what, what could be called a traditional Orthodox family with a name like Whiteford. That, that just doesn't strike the, <laughs> the, the ear the way uh, Ledkovsky does or, or something like that. So, Father John, could you tell us a little bit how you ended up in the Orthodox Church? Well, I was raised in the Church of the Nazarene and um, was actually studying to be a Nazarene pastor. And uh, I wasn't unhappy in the Church of the Nazarene, but I did have a sense that there was something missing. But I actually was d assuming that it was stuff that was in the tradition of the Nazarene Church that had maybe gotten lost with time. Uh, but So I, I felt like there was something missing in the sense of worship. Um, but, uh, but in terms of its doctrine and theology, I was pretty happy with what, you know, what I've been raised in and what I was learning, um, as I was studying to be a minister, although my professors were by Nazarene standards, a little bit more liberal than the Nazarene as a, as a denomination. And had they been more conservative, maybe I wouldn't have started digging into orthodoxy because they asked questions that, uh, caused me to, to, uh, dig deeper to try to defend what I'd always been taught to believe. And um, as a consequence, I started digging into the tradition. There was um, one that in the, in the Wesleyan Arminian tradition, uh, they have a concept of the, what's called the Wesleyan quadrilateral in terms of how do you do theology. And it's, a, it's an expansion on the three-legged stool of uh, Anglicanism. And Ang the Anglicans say that uh, the primary source for theology is scripture, but you interpret it with reason and tradition. And uh, John Wesley, at least according to Wesleyan scholars, added experience to make it a four-legged stool instead of just a three-legged stool. But um, I was doing, a, I, I was actually taking a graduate class at a certain point, and uh, that was sort of an intro to scripture class, but it wasn't intro like this is your first class in scripture. It was a study of introductions to scripture, basically. It's so, like if you read an introduction to the Old Testament, an introduction to the New Testament, that's basically what this class was about, was that field of study. Hmm. And uh, But part of the class was we were supposed to write a, a paper about our own theology of inspiration. And, and I'd always been raised to believe that the scriptures were inerrant, but my professors didn't believe that. I had the two most liberal professors in the department that were tag team teaching this class. Hmm. And uh, so the purpose of this class was to basically get you to the point where you'd say, yeah, the scriptures are inspired, but they got errors. And, you know, the, but so somehow or another, we're able to derive truth from it. But I thought if I'm going to write a paper about what my understanding of inspiration is maybe I'd actually use that Wesleyan quadrilateral that we hear talked about so much. So I talked about what the Bible says about itself in terms of scripture, but then I also went on to tradition. And that's actually what most of my paper was focused on was what does the tradition say about scripture? Mm -hmm. At that time, not being Orthodox, I was viewing uh, the church in sort of a branch theory uh, way. And so I looked at what, first off, what does the early church say? So I was looking at the early church fathers and some later fathers. Um, then I also talked about Roman Catholics and what they had taught historically and uh, went on to talk about various branches of Protestantism and spent a lot of time talking about the Wesleyan Armenian tradition down to the Nazarene, you know, the more famous theologians that we'd had, which the denomination was only uh, established as in its current form in 1908, so it do doesn't have a long history. Uh, but uh, but you know, I I become aware. I, I knew, always knew that there was an Orthodox Church, at least from the time I was a child. I used to thumb my way through the encyclopedia. That was browsing the internet for people in the pre-internet days. Yeah, back in the days. Yeah. So so I remember reading about Eastern Orthodoxy and thinking, well, that's kind of the exotic form of Roman Catholicism. Mm. Uh, but um, but I'd met an Orthodox priest because I was very much involved in the pro-life movement in Oklahoma City, which is where I was going to school. And I'd met this uh, Father Anthony Nelson, who was the priest who later wound up baptizing me. And we had established Operation Rescue Oklahoma City, which Operation Rescue was notable because it was blockading abortion clinics before the federal government made it a felony to do that. And uh, so we had our first meeting and uh, Father Anthony Nelson comes walking in wearing a, a black cassock, a gold cross and a long you know, white beard and his hair and a ponytail. 
And I, I turned to my wife and I said, can you imagine me dressed like that? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'd actually forgot that I said that, but Father Anthony overheard me say that, so he reminded of me of it later. And now, and after he reminded me of it, yeah, I do remember saying that to her. But you know, there, he, you know, you never know, as they say. But um, so I thought, well, let me call Father Anthony up and ask him what does the Orthodox understand about inerrancy or or, or the inspiration of Scripture. And uh, that was the first theological conversation that I'd ever had with him. But when he was explaining the orthodox understanding of inspiration, that actually wound up being the way I, I argued my paper because it made the most sense. And it was consistent with what I found in the church fathers. And um, and I also at the, towards the end of the conversation, asked him to recommend a couple of orthodox books. And so I that was really the beginning of me reading orthodox material beyond the church fathers. And um, so when I Made in this class, it, it was a sort of a seminar presentation. Everybody presented their paper, and then we discussed everybody's, you know, arguments. Well, when I presented my paper, I essentially argued that the church has always believed that the scriptures are in, fully inspired and inerrant, and uh, we know that this is true because the church couldn't teach something throughout its history and have it be wrong. Right, <laughs> and. Uh, and one of my professors said, well, you know, if you're going to argue that kind of line, you're going to have to become a Roman Catholic. You're going to have to accept the Pope and purgatory. And I said, well, you know, I don't know. If, I don't think the church has always believed those things. But if you convince me that they had, I think I'd have to accept it. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, in another class that I had, it was the th theology of Christian worship. We had assignments that we were supposed to go to three different uh, worship services that were different than our own background and write a report about what we saw. So I thought, well, you know, let me go to Father Anthony's church uh, and do a report on that. So I went to a Vesper service. It's right around uh, Christmas, as I recall. And um, I'd never been in an Orthodox service before. And, I, and this was in a storefront that was not very big. It, the ceiling tiles had rust stains. The carpet looked like it was about ready to fall apart. But you know, the singing was, was well done. And I, I was amazed by the beauty of the service. And so it wasn't like I was in the Hagia Sophia, like St. Mm -hmm. St. Vladimir's envoys, but, right. but, it, but I had the same reaction that they had, you know, this was real worship here. Uh, and, uh, and I, out of that, I kind of thought, you know, I should dig more into orthodoxy, but at first I was thinking, well, it'd be useful to be more aware of this historic church. That's obviously played a big role in the history of uh, Christianity. But as time went on, I started thinking, you know, I, I, orthodoxy is pretty cool. I think I could become more orthodox if I could just get past these five issues. But I had five issues, and at first I didn't think I'd ever get past them. But then I thought, well, you know, let me use those, the same methodology. Because I thought I actually had discovered a new method that could solve every theological problem. Just ask the question, what does the church always believe? And then you've, you've answered the question. So I thought, well, has the church always believed what the orthodox church says on these points. And as I started digging into the earliest fathers to try to find where did this idea come from? Is it consistent with what the church has always taught? Gradually, one by one, these issues dropped off my list. And then finally, I got to the end of the list and uh, decided that I, I wanted to become orthodox. So I decided I should probably tell my wife about it. So uh, I'd not said a word to her because I was an uh, associate pastor of a Nazarene church. So I didn't talk mm -hmm. to anybody about my interest in orthodoxy. Although I, I mentioned, you know, I was reading some stuff, but I never let on that this was a serious interest because I figured unless I really am sure this is what I want to do, I don't want people to think that I'm flighty, that I'm, you know, that I bounce around yeah, theologically. Around from spot to spot. Uh, so, uh, so then, you know, my wife was about a year and a half behind me as, as far as my own studies. And, um, it, so she had some catching up to do, and um, I didn't think she was going to convert. I was trying to argue her into orthodoxy, and I found that that was not having the desired effect. So at a certain point, I just decided to stop trying to argue with her. My, my mother actually moved in with us for a while, and I think my mother helped argue her into orthodoxy more than I ever did because she was constantly making snide comments about orthodoxy, and my wife out of an instinct, to, you know, an instinct of loyalty <laughs> would, 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 would often defend me and, and my, 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 uh, my views. And, uh, and, and also she was going to church with me. So mm. I wound up, uh, because I kind of had thought she's not going to convert. What else am I going to do with my life? I'd graduated from college. Um, 
that spring and uh, became a catechumen on St. Olga's Day in uh, July of 1990. And I would have been baptized pretty soon if it hadn't been for the fact that I was hoping my wife would come along. But when I decided that she probably wasn't going to convert, I thought, well, I'm, you know, the first Gulf War was coming down the, the, the pipeline. I thought, well, you know, I, if I can't be a priest, or I, I guess I'd just go into the military and make a career out of that. So I enlisted in the Marine Corps, and I was able to persuade my wife that if I'm getting ready to go into a war zone, probably being baptized before I go would be a good idea. So I was baptized in November of 1990 on the birthday of the Marine Corps, as a matter of fact, uh, mm-hmm. November 10th. And, um, and then uh, was praying, though, that if it wasn't God's will, that it wouldn't happen. Well, uh, in January of 1991, when the air war was going on, we ha- every month we had a, what was called a pool E meeting. You had to go so they could remind you that you'd sworn in and you had a, a date to go to boot camp and you, you need to make sure that you showed up for all that. But they would also try to prepare you for boot camp. And uh, most of the guys I was uh, that were with the group that I was with were right out of high school. I was right out of college. I could have gone into other branches of the service as an officer, but I w- really wanted to go in the Marine Corps. And I was told by people who were Marines that officers candidate school in the Marine Corps is so physically demanding that there's no way you're going to make your way through there unless you go to boot camp first. So, but but they had said that in the Marine Corps it's very easy for enlisted people to go. Uh, on to officers candidate school down the road. So that's the reason why I was going this route. But anyway, we, we, we were running in formation to uh, this park. People were honking their horns, flags waving, you know, everybody, this, you know, everybody was all excited because we were using smart bombs for the first time. And, and uh, everybody thought we were in the right in, in that war. And we played flag football among other things. Well, we played flag football, but all these guys out of high school were playing it like it was tackle. And somebody hit me from behind I felt a pop in my back, and I thought, I'm probably going to have a sore back tomorrow. But by the time we ran back to the recruiting station, I was in a lot of pain, and the next day I could barely stand up. And uh, so God answered my prayer, little did I know at the time, and uh, so I never actually went active duty in the Marine Corps because I, this, this injury didn't go away quickly like I thought that it was going to, and at a certain point I, I just had to press to get released from the Marine Corps. But in the meantime, my wife was coming to church with me, the pressure was off of her because I wasn't talking about becoming a priest anymore. And uh, she went through Holy Week for the first time. And that was at the 12 Passion Gospel service. At the end of that service, she was so moved by it. She said, I want to become Orthodox. What do I need to do? So I, I talked to Father Anthony Nelson and um, she was baptized on Bright Saturday of uh, 1991. Wow. And well, Father, um, you went through you went through quite a quite a, 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 an experience of finding orthodoxy at a time when there really wasn't the internet and you really either had, you had books and, or you had a priest to talk to. That was about it. Right. Yeah. And that, it, th- that was one of my frustrations back in those days, because there was a lot of things about orthodoxy that I was trying to find information on. And you could have pr- put all the books in English that were written specifically for an orthodox audience on one bookshelf at that time. And a lot of them were not really answering the kinds of questions that I had, because what I was wanting to know was, well, when are you supposed to make the sign of the cross in the services? You know, when, when you, what, you know, what, how is an Orthodox Christian go about his day to day life? And there really wasn't that much out there. And uh, so I subscribed to almost every Orthodox uh, magazine that was available in English. So that I could, you know, and that was one way of getting current information about what was going on in the world. Uh, but yeah, it was a lot less information then than there is now. So now it's almost too much information out there. And, and that kind of contrasts Luther with what you probably went through. You had the whole internet, you had YouTube, you had podcasts, you had a lot available to you. Listen, it was it was a gold mine. We we had a farm to eat from. So thanks for <laughs> you guys who pioneered the way. You know. <laughs>